just going to be hyped for the rest of the day. Too bad caffeine. I haven't had any caffeine in my life. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just want to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> you, you, you have to go to sleep tonight, you'll say. Never seen an alpha can for water. <laughs> you pour it out with this one. What am I doing? I might just say. You are my favorite. You know, I might do that. Because I'm going to be too hard. I'd rather do that and stay up all night. Well, I'm exaggerating.
I hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Well, welcome to North Avenue Church. If you're a guest today, we want to thank you so much for uh, attending. Um, we want to apologize in advance to anybody who's not a normal visitor. Normally, you know, after church, you meet and greet and do all those things you like to do. But of course, right now, with the coronavirus, uh, procedures for after church have kind of adjusted a little bit. Uh, so, but we do, we're so glad you're here, and thank you so much for attending church today. How many of you saw the, the email that Mark McAndrew sent out today? Raise your hand for, uh, to our church. So, so if, let, let me give you kind of the heart of that email. Let me give you a quick update. And please note that uh, the individual, this individual that we're going to talk about is, who's listening to us on live right now, uh, and we hope he gets better soon, is uh, giving us permission to provide this update. His, he has a desire for complete transparency, and I greatly respect that. Our music director, uh, Ian Wester, came down with a fever actually last Sunday. But I don't know if you had noticed, but Ian had been really vigilant after church just to be careful with a mask before and after church. But uh, uh, he received some uh, COVID-19 test results last Tuesday from the quick test, and they were negative. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, he started feeling a little worse during the week, and particularly on the weekend. He, he was feeling better, then the temperature stopped on Wednesday, and he was feeling really good. And then on, on this weekend, he started feeling bad again. Um, the test results, well, I guess you say the, the extended test results will not come back till this week sometime. Sometimes the short test is not as accurate. I've heard the number maybe 80%. So he's waiting for those results. When he gets those results, he will let us pass those on to the church, okay? So, Ian, you're out there watching. We sure hope you get to feeling better, and we're thinking about you. One thing that kind of concerned Ian was when his temperature came back, he had a loss of taste and smell. And as you know from, from what you read, that's a little bit of a sign that he possibly could have the coronavirus. So he and Aaron will not be at church today, okay? So when you, we don't want you to wonder if you're new or you've heard that Ian leads our music we want you to understand why Ian is not here and Aaron's not here. Normally, they are always here. Uh, we, we decided that anyone that was in kind of close contact with Ian over the last 72 hours would also not be at church today. And so that includes our very own Mark McAndrew. Hey, Mark. So Mark's actually watching uh, from the computer today. Uh, I do want to make a note, too. One of our elders, Jerry Ediker, Jerry has not returned to church for in-person worship since the onset of the coronavirus, but that is simply as a precaution, okay? Jerry's actually watching today. Hey, Jerry. And I, we also want you to know that Jerry's very involved with the church. We do all our elder meetings by technology, and, and Jerry's still doing a lot of things behind the scenes, but he's still a very integral part of our church, and we're, of course, looking um, to, to the future where he'll be back with us in person. I know y'all have missed Jerry, and I have too. <laughs> uh, so... Today, let's be mindful. Let's, you know, when you, when you leave today, wash your hands, use some hand sanitizer, try to avoid physical contact with others, uh, try to remain six feet apart when you can, and whenever possible, we really encourage you to do that. If, you're, if, you're, if you brought, brought a mask today, we'd ask you that you, when you're leaving, wear it. If you did not bring a mask and you did not wear a mask, we simply ask that you adhere to the six-foot rule when you're leaving. Okay, so that's pretty simple. We, we have the balcony area if anybody asks we want to go over that again if if anybody wants to be in an area where they think a couple of things either they just want to be in an area where everybody has a mask on or someone could be immune compromised if you sit in the balcony you have to have the mask on at all times that's just the guidelines okay so if, if somebody says ask you about church then please mention that option for them i got a lot of things little things to go over i want to make a, make sure i miss anything Today, we're going to, you remember when we first started, Greg's going to dismiss us today how we did when we first came back from the virus. So we'll start from the back rows and then work our way out. We're going to kind of be dismissed today like we did when we first came back. There's a chance, a possibility, that we might have to call off the Bible study this Tuesday. If you're planning to come, please monitor group me or monitor your email. 
Here's the one thing we want to tell you. As elders, we're trying to act like a true body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, and so it is with Christ. So I'm not an expert on the human body, but we have some scientists in, this, you know, in our church that are. But I will tell you this, the body has to communicate. If it doesn't communicate, you're in trouble. What if your feet does not communicate with your brain? You'd be, you'd be in trouble pretty fast. So all we're trying to tell you is elders, we're simply trying to model that principle. We're not trying to startle anybody behind the mention of this stuff. We're not trying to let it dominate the service. And we're sure not trying to scare anybody. We're simply trying to be proactive, transparent, and communicative and let everybody make their own decision according to their own convictions of the virus. If people have questions about what's said, here's the best thing to do. Send them the email or have them watch this announcement at church. If you have suggestions or you have questions for one of the elders, please see us. We're easy to communicate with. You know, so we, we know that there's something we might not be thinking about, so don't hesitate to give us any feedback that you think we need. So and here's the good news in God's divine providence today. Scott was already plan, planning to preach today. Yay! So we didn't have to, no, nobody had to scramble to do a sermon today. So that's good. Now, let me tell you who gets the hero sticker for today. Greg Rentz was already doing confession. Greg Rentz will lead the, the music today a cappella. Woo! All right. I mean, man, that is, man, he is my hero, okay? I've had to lead the music. There'll be nobody here when it finished, okay? So we're Greg, you know, and then Greg's also going to do the closing. And so we're so, we just, but please, we love you. And we're just trying to be communicative. And, and Ian and the Webster family are thinking about you. We love you guys and everybody else that are watching. And I'm going to turn it over to Scott McAndrew for some kind of announcement type recognition. All right. Right. Well, this Sunday, sadly, is the last Sunday that the Fieros are going to be here as, a, as part of our church. Manuel and Sarah, Camila, Isabel, their two precious daughters, their last Sunday here. And I uh, just want to say a few words about them. Mark uh, was going to do this, so he, he put this on me this morning to say a little bit about the Fieros. Uh, anybody who knows the Fieros well has a deep love for the Fieros. I am sure that all the people in this room who know them well have a deep love for the Fieros. They have been a part of our church pretty much for the last four years, maybe a little over four years now, and they have served our church joyfully. They have served our church sacrificially. When our f church first started, we had one discussion group, but very quickly we were going to break that off and we're going to have two discussion groups. Well, Manuel was going to be co-leading that other discussion group with Bo Beck. And so we began that second discussion group, and they began co-leading that. And Manuel and Bo did a great job. And then soon after that, we transitioned to Manuel and Sarah's house, and they did a great job hosting us. They showed such great hospitality to anybody who went there to their house. You, you just saw their hospitality on display. They were so warm and welcoming. There was always coffee. There was always treats of some kind, just so kind and gracious, obviously gifted with hospitality and service. But some things that I love about the Fieros, number one, they have a deep love for non-Christians in their life. I can remember so many nights at the discussion group where either Sarah or Manuel would bring up somebody, one of their co-workers or one of their friends who didn't know the Lord, and they're trying to pursue them, trying to share the gospel with them. They wanted us to pray, or they were going to have a couple over, and they wanted to share the gospel with them over dinner, and we would pray for those conversations. Just they have a deep love for non-believers. They want to see non-Christians come to know the Savior. They have encouraged us so many times, Liliana and I, many times they have encouraged us personally. They wrote us letters that we still have filled with deep words of encouragement that we have cherished those letters and we will hold on to those letters. And they have prayed for us consistently and faithfully. I remember, I mean, if anybody shared something to them, asked them to pray for them, they would be faithful to pray for you no matter what the issue was. And they, they were a part of our adoption process from the beginning, and they prayed with us from the beginning regularly, consistently. And then Michael is born, and we are matched, and they rejoiced with us. And then Michael was stuck in the NICU for eight weeks, and they prayed 
consistently and faithfully. I remember she, Sarah wrote Liliana and said that every night they were praying for Michael and God was gracious to answer their prayers and so many other people's prayers. So they have encouraged us powerfully. I love how they apply biblical truth to their life. It's not just simply biblical knowledge. Yes, they want to understand, but they want to apply the biblical truth into their lives. They want to live it out. And I could give lots of examples. I'll give just one Maybe a month ago or so, we were having a discussion group on Zoom, and Manuel was asking for prayer, dealing with sort of being impatient with his daughter, Camila. He was losing his temper a little bit. He was asking us to pray for for them in this, pray for him specifically in that. And then I had just, I had heard something about this, so I just shared that, you know, Manuel, I'd read this or heard somebody say that, you know, when we sin against our children, which we are going to do, what an opportunity that is for us to model our need for God's grace and forgiveness so we can model it. We can go to them and ask forgiveness to our children and say, we need the grace of God as well. The very next week, Manuel gets on there and he says, thank you, Scott, for sharing that. I had an opportunity to put that into practice this last week. He got impatient with Camila and he was able to go to her and apologize to her and show his need of God's grace as well. Manuel is obviously gifted, intellectually brilliant mind. He's a PhD. He's Dr. Fierro now. But man, he is a humble, such a humble guy and teachable. Uh, So many times I remember a discussion group or in our book club, he would say something. He wasn't 100% sure if this statement he was about to make was theologically accurate. So he'd say, if someone would correct me, please correct me. I'm open to being corrected. I mean, just so humble in his approach. And if the rare occasion came up where someone maybe would tweak what he said, he would turn and genuinely thank them for helping him understand the Bible better. So such humility with Manuel. Sarah has been gifted tremendously in the gift of service uh, in an extraordinary way. And she's been on staff at our church since 2018. And just what a joy it has been for us to, to benefit from her gifting. Uh, I just think about all the ways behind the scenes she has served and served and served and done it all joyfully. She wrote a letter to the elders. It was moving to read how she just took delight in doing like tax work and paperwork. She just took joy in that and she did it so well. You, I think of the retreats, how she just worked everything behind the scenes that she and Manuel would go and find the place and just work out all the details. And it was just everything would work smoothly at those retreats or the meals or conferences. Uh, she has served our church in tremendous ways and uh, we are going to miss them so much. So let me just pray for the Fieros and then pray for our service. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we are so thankful uh, for the Fieros, for Manuel and Sarah. We're th- so thankful for their two precious daughters, Camila and Isabel, and uh, they are gifts. We're so thankful that you have uh, brought them to our church and that they have been a part of our church for uh, over four years now. Uh, what, a, what a gift they have been to our church Uh, We pray that you would go with them to Iowa, give them traveling mercies, give them a safe trip there, and uh, I pray that they would be able to find a local church there, and they would get connected and get involved there, and we know that they will be a tremendous blessing to that church. We pray for those two precious daughters of theirs. We pray that they would grow up loving you from a young age. You would save them at a young age, and we pray that they would love the church Uh, that they would honor you with their lives and that you would give Sarah and Manuel uh, just wisdom to raise their daughters in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, we are just so thankful uh, for their friendship, for their love and encouragement that they are to our church. We pray that you'd be with us now as we sing, be with Greg as he leads us and help us to sing out joyfully to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hopefully you won't miss Ian too bad because of my time uh, up here. Um, All right, if you'll stand, we are going to sing. Our first song is Jesus Paid It All. All right, it is up there. Okay, again, this is a cappella, so there's no no instruments or anything like that. It's kind of old-fashioned in some ways. Um, And so I'll do my best to kind of give the lead and uh, don't hold any uh, missed notes or, you know, those weird vocal things that happen. Don't hold that against me too bad. Uh, but we'll, we'll get started. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All 
to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all. Amen. You may be seated. And now you get stuck with me for the uh, confessional as well. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of the book of Genesis. As you know, we've been trying to kind of gear our times of confession to, um, to, the, pat, to the chapters or the, the books that we're reading for the month um, as a church. And we've been in Genesis uh, through July, and so it's kind of fitting that we finished July in chapter 50. Uh, we're going to read in Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. And before we do, this is a, a very familiar passage, or should be, uh, the story of Joseph. Uh, we're all familiar with the story of Joseph, um, just how when he was younger, he was kind of the favorite of his father, Jacob. And Jacob kind of made that plain so that his brothers actually hated him because of his father's extra favor given to him. And Joseph was given these, these visions um, of his brothers and then his mother and father bowing down to him. And then, you know, like any good teenager would, he shared that with his family. And they hated him even more because of probably planning, hoping for an occasion to, uh, to get him for that. And so, as you know, his father sent him to go check on his brothers. They were out shepherding the flock um, near, I think it was near Shechem. And so he goes out, he eventually finds him. They see him coming a long way off and they're like, there's that dreamer, let's get him. They had originally planned to kill him, but then I think it was Reuben was like, well, you know, no, we're not going to do that. He's, he's our brother, so let's, let's put him in the pit. Um, and Reuben, you know, kind of won him over. He thought he was going to come back and rescue Joseph. It didn't happen. They saw these traitors going by, the Ishmaelites. So they sell their brother into slavery. Um, and, you know, they go back. They lie to their father. He's dead. Uh, an animal killed him. And, you know, Jacob thinks he's lost Joseph. But Joseph is taken by these traders into Egypt where he's sold into the house of Potiphar, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And um, while there, the favor of God is on Joseph. Uh, Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of his whole household and, and Joseph um, does everything well. Potiphar could not ask for a better head servant. Um, everything goes well for Potiphar. And as we know, the story comes Potiphar's wife takes an interest in Joseph and keeps trying to get him to, uh, to sleep with her and commit immorality. Joseph refuses again and again and again and again. And what's interesting, 
you compare, and I had not thought of this until just now, you compare Joseph with Samson, Samson eventually gave away his secret because he was pestered by Delilah. Joseph never gave in. Um, so you see just a contrast of characters showing it is possible to resist repeated temptation in the same area. But Joseph refuses to give in. He's like, how could I sin against my master? And even more, how could I sin against God by doing this? Um, but eventually she's able to like catch him and get his cloak and he flees and she blames him for trying to, to, to uh, take advantage of her. And he's thrown into prison by Potiphar who's angry. It's interesting, it never says who he's angry at. Just that he's angry at the situation. Um, and so Joseph is now in prison. Uh, he, he was sold into slavery, was evil what was done to him, even if he could have been a little more humble with his brothers. It was wrong and evil what they did to him. It was evil what Potiphar's wife did to him. She lied about him. She falsely accused him, and he was thrown into prison on account of that. And then we come to the time in prison. He's there uh, again, the favor of God is with Joseph. God's hand is on him for good. And in everything he does, he's put in charge of the prison, of the prisoners, taking care of everything. Um, so much was God with him. And then you know the story, the chief baker and the cupbearer, they come in, they're put in prison. Pharaoh's angry with them. And so they're in prison and then they both have these dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams. It turns out good for the cupbearer, bad for the baker. Cupbearer's restored, the baker's hanged. Um, and Joseph's like, you know, look, I've interpreted these for you. You know, remember me when you get out. Remember me. But he doesn't. So for another two plus years, Joseph languishes. And you know the story. Pharaoh has these dreams about a coming uh, seven year season where they're going to have more plenty in terms of livestock and agriculture than they could have ever thought possible. And then after that, another seven years of the worst famine imaginable. And Pharaoh can't get anybody to help him. So then the cupbearer's like, oh, you know, I'm a doofus. I forgot. There's this guy who can interpret dreams. He did mine. And so they bring Joseph out and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, tells Pharaoh what's going to happen. Um, and, and Pharaoh acknowledges that this, some spirit of God or a God is at work in this man. We're going to listen to what he says. And Joseph gets put in charge over all of Egypt. Over the whole thing, the only one with more authority and greater majesty than Joseph is Pharaoh himself. And so as the famine eventually comes, you know the story, his family comes, and he, through a, matter, through a series of tests and testing them, finds out that they have truly changed. Especially when Judah is willing to put himself on the line, um, his own life, in order to not see his father disappointed at the loss of another son. That's when Joseph's like, okay, something is different, they're changed um, and so that's what's happened. They all moved to Egypt. We know that story. And so by now you'd think Joseph's brothers have understood Joseph is not holding their ev the evil that they did to him. He's not holding that against them. But Jacob, their father, has died. And now let's pick up in verse 15 and let's see what happens. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph, it says, it's interesting, he wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And just a couple of quick thoughts uh, before we go to prayer. One, I think it's very clear that Joseph had a very vibrant understanding and grasp of God's good sovereignty. And I don't just say sovereignty in general, but God's good sovereignty. All that God does on behalf of his people, he does for their good. And as, as believers here, take that to heart. Every single thing that comes your way is directed by the hand of your loving Heavenly Father for 
your good, for my good, for each one of us. Joseph finally got to a place, and he, he had been there for a while, it seems, because this seems a very confident thing that he says. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So what we see is that God has the sovereign power to override human evil and bring about good that mankind never intended. And then no way does that ever mean God's okay with sin. Does that mean that God's okay with evil? We know a day of judgment is coming when he will judge all evil and judge those who commit it and have not repented. But God is not hindered by human evil. And Joseph got that. Not only is he not hindered by human evil, but he can override it to the point that it actually ends up serving his purposes. So Joseph's brothers, they intended evil. They didn't have a sense, well, we know God's going to use this in some special way for Joseph, so that makes it okay. No, they hated their brother. And Joseph knew that what they did, they did out of malice. And it was evil what they did. And that's why he says, you meant evil, but God meant it for good. Same word in the Hebrew for meant, intended. And Joseph, why, why did, why, how did he come to that conclusion? Look at the rest of the verse, verse 20. It says, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are this day. Joseph understood that that course of repeatedly being wronged and treated maliciously and evilly by his brothers, by, by the wife of, of, Pharaoh, of, of Potiphar, he realized all that he had gone through, all that evil that he had endured was God's process to get him to where he could actually end up being the savior of the whole world at that time from this famine that was so great. And the other thing it did, it kept him from bitterness towards his brothers. It kept him from bitterness towards his brothers. When people have done us wrong, it is so, if, in, I mean, maybe you don't struggle with this, I do. It is so easy to hold evil against people. And, you know, we, we tend to think in terms of, of big things, but just think in your relationships, in your own home, and, and those with those closest to you, little comments here, little actions here. If we are not careful, we can hold on to those in the worst way and then hold that against the people that we love. And Joseph understood that yes, his brothers had done wrong. He never excused their sin. But he also was not bitter at them. He had seen that God had changed their hearts. He saw that they were broken and they were sorry and they were repentant over what they had done to him. And he understood. So one, God's sovereign. Two, they are repentant. There is no way under the sun I can remain angry at them for what they did to me. And so as we go to prayer, one, I just encourage you, examine your own heart in light of all this going on in our world today. Um, you know, are we trusting that God is not just sovereign, but that he is exercising his sovereignty for us with nothing but our good in mind? Are we trusting in his good purpose in all that we're experiencing right now? And number two, evaluate relationships, things you've gone through, has, has, have those things moved you to bitterness? And if they have in any way, if you're struggling with forgiveness, struggling with holding something against someone, take, take, take some encouragement from Joseph. It never excuses evil, but we understand God is sovereign even over that. And especially if someone is repentant, pray that God would help you forgive them. So whatever that means for you right now, let's spend a few moments praying and then I'll close this together. So let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I know I am so prone to, uh, to need what we see here at the end of Genesis. One, God, I'm prone not to trust you and your good sovereignty and your good purposes uh, for me. Um, Lord, I know I'm probably not alone in that. 
Uh, Lord, I, I know I struggle. Um, bitterness is so easy. But God, you are sovereign. And Lord, every single thing that comes my way, that comes any of our way, Lord, is not without purpose. And so God, help each one of us to, to have Joseph's perspective that you are at work, as Romans 8 says, to, to work all things together for our good. Even the most difficult of circumstances, the ones that, that are not on account of anything we've done. Lord, you are at work in those for our good. And Lord, help us trusting in your sovereignty, trusting in the power of the gospel, the power of Christ who has forgiven us the, 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 the greater offense by far. Help us, Lord, be able to forgive. Help us to not hold on to bitterness. But Lord, help us have the attitude Joseph did. Lord, where we can encourage others because we know that God is sovereign. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how clear it is. Help us walk in submission and obedience to it. Even this week, Lord, give us a chance to live out the things we've just looked at. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, you can remain seated, but we're going to sing our next song, which is Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God. your Bibles. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 10 to 13 of Philippians chapter 4. Well-known verses, wonderful verses. Philippians chapter 4, 
verses 10 to 13. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Please hear this public reading of God's word. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your precious word that we get to open up and look at and study from. Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things from this passage of Scripture. Father, I pray that as we consider contentment, As we consider learning the secret of Christian contentment, I pray that you would help us to see Christian contentment as something beautiful and precious and valuable and attractive, and I pray that we would leave here wanting to strive to pursue Christian contentment. Help us to value it. Help us to see our need for it. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my sermon is Learning the Secret of Christian contentment, learning the secret of Christian contentment. And one of the goals I have today is I want to lift up Christian contentment before us, and I want us to see Christian contentment as beautiful, as compelling, as radiant, as attractive. I want us to see it as an important need in the Christian life. But the first thing I'll say about Christian contentment before we jump into our passage is that Christian contentment, sadly, is rare. It's a rare thing amongst Christians. A Puritan author named Jeremiah Burroughs wrote a famous book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I know some of you are reading that book, I think, right now. He called Christian Contentment a rare jewel, a rare jewel of Christian contentment. There's a pastor who wrote a book just last year. He wrote an updated version of that book. His name is Andy Davis, and he wrote a book called The Power of Christian Contentment. And Andy Davis said, most Christians don't learn consistent contentment. Most Christians don't ever learn consistent contentment. So Christian contentment is a rare thing, and most Christians don't learn consistent contentment. Well, if Christian contentment is beautiful and compelling and attractive, why do so few Christians learn consistent contentment? Contentment. Well, I think maybe a couple of answers to give to that would be one of the reasons why we don't learn consistent contentment is because we're living in a society that is permeated by a spirit of discontentment. I mean, just, just living in it, swimming in it. We're swimming up against the tide, against the stream of the world. I mean, you, we've been around people probably, it's just they're not content with anything. There's just this spirit of discontentment in our world. That's going to be a challenge for us as we pursue Christian contentment. But not only that, Alistair Begg said that he faced discontentment in his own mind and his own heart on perhaps a daily basis. So we're going to face discontentment in our own mind, our own hearts, on a daily basis probably, and then we're swimming against the tide. So these two reasons are why it's going to be an uphill battle. But I want to say that it's going to be worth it. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it to pursue Christian contentment. Andy Davis begins his book, The Power of Christian Contentment, with this true story. It's 1990, and it's in Brazil, and there's a Brazilian farmer, and he's on his property, and he's gone down to the river on his property, and he's getting water for his fields, and while he's getting water on his property, he sees something out of the corner of his eye, catches his attention in the water, and he heads over to this spot, and he reaches down, and he picks up this stone from the water, and he begins to examine it and wipe it off and look it over. Now, he has no idea that what he has just picked up was a diamond, and it was not any old diamond. It was a large diamond. It was 13.9 carats in its rough form. And not only was it any old diamond, this was an exceedingly rare diamond. This was a red diamond, which apparently red diamonds are the rarest of all diamonds. So he had just picked up an exceedingly rare and large red diamond. He eventually would sell this diamond to a diamond company. This diamond company made multiple trips down to Brazil to pry it loose from him, and I'm sure they paid a handsome fee to get this diamond. 
And once this diamond company got it, they had all these master cutters got together, and I'm sure they were very excited about this diamond. What are we going to do with this diamond? How are we going to cut it? How are we going to shape it? And they finally decided on the shape, and they went to work cutting on this diamond, and they picked a triangular shape, and they cut it down to this triangular shape, and in its final form, it was 5.11 carats. Originally, it was called the Red Shield. They eventually sold it to another owner. It has changed name since then. They sold it apparently for $8 million. They sold this diamond. It has been on display at the Smithsonian Museum a couple of different times. Hundreds and thousands of people probably have come and seen it and just been marveled at the beauty of this red diamond. Andy Davis says this, This amazing red diamond is exceedingly precious, but an immeasurably more precious jewel to the Christian is contentment. An immeasurably more precious jewel to the Christian is contentment. Let me press his illustration just a little bit further. Let's say a couple of years from now, I can't do it today since we're in the COVID deal, but say a couple of years from now, somebody from Central Baptist Church came to us after the service and they said, there is a diamond just like this red shield. It is buried right out here underneath the playground area. It's about 50 feet down. We'll give you these handful of shovels. You can only dig with these shovels, but if you're able to dig with just these shovels, if you're able to dig down 50 feet and you're able to find this diamond, North Avenue Church can have that diamond. Well, very quickly, we would go to work. We would have sign-up sheets and teams shifts, sign-up sheets for shifts to go, and people would immediately begin after church starting to dig with the shovels. They'd be digging down. We'd have sign-up sheets for people to bring food. We'd have sign-up sheets for people to bring refreshments and water. We'd buy lights out there. We'd be working around the clock, 24 hours a day. And I think we would dig down there, and I think we would eventually get that diamond. Honestly, I think I'd put Alan McCannon in charge of the whole thing. We'd have the diamond within a week. But the point of, the, of this illustration is that we would put all kinds of energy and effort and we would strive and, and sweat and toil to dig down to get this diamond. But how much more energy and effort should we put into pursuing Christian contentment? So much more energy and effort we should put into pursuing Christian contentment because Christian contentment is immeasurably more valuable than the rarest diamond in the world. Let's jump into our text, the beginning of verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. So let me just set the stage here again with this letter. We're jumping a little bit ahead from where we were last time. So let me just set the stage, remind you, Paul is under house arrest in Rome. He is chained to a guard, a group of guards, and he's sharing the gospel with these guards, and he's writing to this Philippian church that he loves, that he has planted this church. And in order for us to understand this portion of Philippians properly, we need to know something that we haven't covered yet, and is this. Epaphroditus has come from the Philippian church, and he has brought gifts to the Apostle Paul. And we know from chapter 2 that Epaphroditus risked his life to bring these gifts to the Apostle Paul. So let me set the scene. Paul, under house arrest, he is chained to a guard. You have Epaphroditus very likely sitting in front of him, and you have these gifts. Let's say it's a, it's a bag of silver coins that is sitting between Paul and Epaphroditus. Look at verse 18 of chapter 4. We see a little bit more about this. Verse 18 says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus risked his life to bring these gifts. Now look back at verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Paul is exuberant with joy because the Philippians have sent these gifts to the Apostle Paul. He is spontaneously, exuberantly thankful and joyful that the Philippian church have sent these gifts to him. But Paul can't just stop in this one sentence. He's got to keep going because he realizes that first sentence could be misunderstood. You notice how he says, beginning of verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. He realizes that could be misunderstood. Some people may think, wait a minute, Paul, so we were concerned for you, we stopped being concerned for you, and now we're concerned for you? So he wants to clear that up. Middle of verse 10, now he clears this up. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So they've always been concerned for him. They just haven't been able to send him gifts for a long time. And finally, after probably years of time, they had this opportunity. Epaphroditus is going to go. And they said, this is the perfect opportunity. Let's send gifts with Epaphroditus. They send these gifts with Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus goes and brings these gifts to Paul. And Paul is joyful. But Paul can't stop right there. Being the teacher of the gospel that he is, he realizes he can use this as a teaching tool for the Philippian church. So he keeps going. Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
This is fantastic, what Paul is doing right here. You notice what he's doing. What Paul is saying is, yes, he's rejoicing that they have sent these gifts, but what Paul is saying is his contentment is not tied to that money in any way. It is not tied to it at all. Paul is saying that he was content when it was just him and the guards before Epaphroditus showed up. He was content when Epaphroditus came. He was content with the money there. He will be content when Epaphroditus leaves. He will be content when that money is spent and gone. Yes, he's appreciative for this money. He knows it's going to meet his physical needs, but his contentment is not at all tied to that money. And notice how he says in the middle of verse 11, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, I thank God that the Apostle Paul said, for I have learned. Why is Lloyd-Jones thanking God that Paul says, for I have learned? Why is he so happy about that? Well, Lloyd-Jones is thanking God because that means that the Apostle Paul, after his conversion, he didn't immediately arrive at contentment. This was something that the Apostle Paul realized he needed to grow in. He needed to make progress in this area. And what Paul is saying that over time, probably years of time, he was able to learn the secret of contentment. He was able to learn contentment. So it should be hugely encouraging to us. If we are struggling with being content consistently, well, welcome to the club. Join the club. The Apostle Paul was there at one time. And the encouraging thing is that we, by the grace of God, can learn the secret of contentment. It should be hugely encouraging. I was talking to Jerry Ediger on the phone this morning, and he said, maybe we're just at two percentage points of of contentment. Maybe we're just two percent. But he said, we can, by the grace of God, we can make it to three percent. And then we can make it to four and five and six, and we can make progress all the way up to 100% by the grace of God. We can learn to be content. That should be hugely encouraging to us. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. You have this powerful verse here where you have Paul giving three sort of abounding words, three sort of brought low words, and you've got in any and every circumstance thrown in the middle of all of this. Look look at it one more time. I know how to be brought low. Here's the low word. I know how to abound. There's the abounding word. Then in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, here's the abounding, facing plenty. Here's brought low, hunger, abundance, and need. What is Paul saying in verse 12? Paul's saying that his contentment is not based on his circumstances. His contentment is independent of his circumstances. Paul, I think, realized that very right away that circumstances are always changing. They're always going up and down. Sometimes we're abounding. Sometimes we're brought low. Sometimes we're in need. Sometimes we're hungry. Sometimes we have plenty. So how could our contentment be tied to our circumstances? If it is, we're never going to have consistent contentment. So contentment is not tied to our circumstances. And certainly the Apostle Paul Uh, exemplified this in his life. You think about when this church was planted. Mark mentioned this in his first sermon on Philippians. You think of Acts chapter 16 where when Paul and Silas are in Philippi and there's that demon-possessed girl and Paul casts out the demon-possessed girl and the owners of this girl are angry because they can no longer make money and they stir up the crowds against Paul and Silas and the magistrates get involved and they strip Paul and Silas of their clothes and they're beaten with rods and they're cast into the prison. Well, certainly, if Paul and Silas' contentment were based on abounding circumstances, their contentment would have been gone in the prison. But in the prison at midnight, what does the text say? They're praying and singing hymns to God for the joy of their salvation because their contentment is not tied to their circumstances, independent of circumstances. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I don't know if there's been a more misapplied verse in the entire Bible than Philippians 4, 13. Maybe you've seen posters with a guy climbing a rock face, a very difficult rock face, and it's got Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? Or maybe you've seen a, a t-shirt with a kid hitting a home run. I can do all things through Christ. Well, one pastor said, what about the kid who strikes out every time? Can he do all things through Christ who strengthens him? Or some people think, you know, I can make an A on this test. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Alistair Begg said, and then you go and take the test and you fail. And actually, you can do all things. You can fail through Christ who strengthens you. You can be brought low through Christ who strengthens you. So what does this actually mean? Well, let me read verses 12 and 13 back to back so we can see it in context. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
One commentator said the contextual meaning of all refers to the previous claim to be content, whatever the circumstances. Paul is saying that he can live with contentment in any and every circumstance through Christ who strengthens him. That's what he's saying in verse 13. This is incredible. So Paul can be content through Christ when he is brought low. He can be content through Christ when he's abounding. He can be content through Christ in any and every circumstance. That's what Paul is getting at in verses 12 and 13. So let me give you four quotes from four different people about contentment, about the importance of contentment. Four quotes. Number one, Christian contentment is something that we fight for. Number two, Christian contentment is an objective to be cultivated by all believers who want to grow in Christ. Number three, we should resolve to learn the secret of contentment. Number four, let this become our ambition. Let us strain every nerve and do everything we can to get into this blessed state of Christian contentment. Are they overstating the case? Do we really have to fight for Christian contentment? Is this something we should resolve to learn the secret of Christian contentment? Should this be our ambition? Should we strain every nerve and do everything we can to get into this blessed state? Aren't they overstating the case? I don't think so. I don't think so. And here's where I want to lift up the beauty of Christian contentment for us and see it as compelling and attractive. So my question now is going to be, why should we pursue Christian contentment? And then we're going to talk about how we do it. But I'm going to have five reasons why we should strive after contentment. Number one, we should strive after contentment because we are commanded to be content. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We should pursue godliness. We should pursue contentment because godliness with contentment is great gain. We are commanded to be content. So we should pursue and strive after contentment because we are commanded to be content. Number two, we should strive after contentment because contentment brings God great glory. Contentment brings God great glory, especially when we as God's children go through suffering, when we respond to suffering with a sweet submission and loving trust to our Heavenly Father, that brings God great glory. I think of Habakkuk chapter 3, these famous verses in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Hear this verse. This is, talk, this is being brought low in Habakkuk 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. This is being brought low. But then listen to what the author says. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. When we respond like that, especially in suffering, that will bring God great glory, when we rejoice in the Lord and take joy in the God of our salvation. Many of you know Nabil Qureshi, who died of cancer just a few years ago. He, he, it was discovered that he had, I think, advanced stomach cancer, and he was in his early 30s, and he was going to leave behind a wife and a young daughter with his advanced cancer, and he would die and leave behind a wife and a young daughter. And I remember seeing a picture of him before he died singing. He had his hands raised, and he is worshiping God with advanced cancer. And I thought it was beautiful. He is bringing God great glory when he remained content in and through suffering. He was taking joy in the God of his salvation. Number three, we should strive after contentment because discontentment leads to other sins. Discontentment leads to other sins. When we are filled with discontentment, we are going to be prone to complain we're going to be prone to be irritable. We're going to be prone to be impatient. We're going to be prone to be bitter, as Greg mentioned earlier. We're going to be prone to be unkind and be filled with self-pity and on and on and on. You could list these other sins. So we should pursue and cultivate contentment because discontentment leads to other sins. Just take the sin of complaining for just a second. Mark talked about it last Sunday, the sin of complaining. Jeremiah Burroughs, paraphrasing him, he said, there is more evil in the habit of complaining than we are aware of. More evil in the habit of complaining than we are aware of. And Andy Davis says, do we really have any conception of how many complaints we've uttered in the last year? 
How many complaints have we made? And I think of the people watching and the people in this room, it's got to be thousands of complaints that we have made within the last year. But if we arrive and learn consistent Christian contentment, I think the sin of complaining will be done. I think this sin will be done away with. This should be a huge motivation for us to pursue contentment because complaining will be done away with. Think about Paul and Silas had their contentment dried up in that prison. How quickly discontentment would have settled into their souls and how quickly complaining would have come out of them about how badly they're hurt, about how horrible the the stocks are, whatever. There would have been just complaining, complaining, complaining. And yet, since they had contentment, they're praying and singing hymns to God. So if we cultivate contentment, we will make progress against all these other sins in our life. Andy Davis said, esteem contentment highly and hate complaining passionately. Number four, which ties in with the third one, is contentment will, will be a shield against temptation. Contentment will be a shield against temptation. So if we are filled with contentment, we are going to be hard to tempt. We're going to be hard to tempt. So think about it like this. Think about contentment being a shield against temptation. Think about temptation as flaming arrows being shot at us. These temptations to complain, these temptations to be irritable, these are flaming arrows being shot at us. Well, if we are filled with contentment, we're holding this metal shield, and those arrows are going to hit that shield, and they will not harm us. They will not touch us. They will fall to the ground and go out because we are going to be hard to tempt. But if we are filled with discontentment, It's like we drop that shield down and we've got indwelling sin within us. Think of kindling wood inside of us. And when we're filled with discontentment, it's like taking this kindling wood, dipping it in gasoline, and we hold it out in front of ourselves. And when that flaming arrow comes at us, the temptation to complain is going to hit that kindling wood. It's going to ignite. I mean, just think about something as simple as the air conditioner going out in your home or at work and how quickly discontentment can begin to settle in And it gets hotter, and it gets hotter, and it gets hotter, and the discontentment is rolling. And just think about that flaming arrow to complain comes at you, and how quickly people will begin to complain about the temperature and how uncomfortable it is. It's just like dominoes. But if we're filled with contentment, we will be guarded against temptation. Number five, we should pursue contentment because when we are discontent, we lose sight of the mercies of God. When we are discontent, we lose sight of the mercies of God. I I got this from Thomas Watson. I just uh, was blown away by this one. When we're filled with discontentment, we lose sight of the mercies of God. And I'll just, I came up with a made-up story to try to illustrate this point. Let's say we've got a, a guy, he's a genuine Christian. He's a businessman. He's married with a couple of young kids, and he works hard at his job. And he's been there for several years, and he's certain he's going to get this promotion, a promotion that he feels like he's going to be better at this job in terms of the job duties, he's going to be better. He's going to be better suited for that. He's going to have more money. He's going to be better able to provide for his family. He's certain he's going to get it. And the day comes when he's going to find out if he's gotten this job and he gets to work and his boss calls him in and his boss tells him that unfortunately he has not gotten the promotion, but some, one of the other coworkers has been promoted ahead of him. And he heads back to his office and discontentment begins to cloud over him and begins to settle inside of him as he begins to fixate on this one thing that is causing his discontentment. He's focused in on the fact that he hasn't gotten this job promotion and this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's filling his gaze. And it's just full on now. He's, he's discontent. And you can think about all these other sins he's going to give into during that day. He could be angry at his boss. He could be thinking bad thoughts about his coworker got promoted. All kinds of things that he's better, whatever it is. All kinds of other sins. But he's filled with this discontentment. The, the thing is, he's not going to see the mercies of God. He's going to be blinded to the mercies of God. So he gets in his car, angry, frustrated, discontent, and he begins to drive home. And there's this beautiful sunset on the drive home, but he hardly even lifts his eyes to see the sunset. He goes home and he opens the door and his kids run to embrace him. And he hardly pays attention to his children. He, he sees the mess in the living room. And his wife has prepared a wonderful meal, and he hardly pays any attention. He sits down and makes a prayer. His children are laughing, having a great time, and yet his mind is distant, and he misses it all. He doesn't even want to pray and do a devotion with his kids after dinner. He just wants to go away to his office and fume, and he has missed the mercies of God. But rewind the tape. 
and say he remains content when he doesn't get the promotion. And he gets in his car and he drives home and he sees the sunset. And he's blown away. The heavens are telling the glory of God day after day. They pour forth speech and he burst into prayer. Thank you, Father, for this display of your glory. It's beautiful. He drives home and his kids race to him. And he's amazed that God has given him the privilege to be their parents. And he plays with the toys. He smells the food and he's amazed at the wife God has given to him. And he sits down to eat and he offers a genuine prayer of thanksgiving for the food and he takes part in the conversation. He can't wait to pray with his children and read the Bible with his children, all seeing it all as a privilege. And he sees the mercies of God. So when we're filled with contentment, it's like putting on high-definition goggles or glasses so that we can see the mercies of God. Discontentment will lead to ungratefulness and thanklessness, but contentment will, will, will lead to over, uh, abundant thanksgiving. So now the question is, how are we going to cultivate this type of contentment? How are we going to cultivate this type of of contentment. Well, first let me let me define what I mean by contentment. Just so we're on the same page. When I say Christian contentment, I don't mean that we are content with our sinfulness. Not what I'm saying. I don't mean that we are content with our spiritual progress. Not what I'm saying. And I hope we're, we're never content with our spiritual progress. I hope we'll be striving after the Lord, pursuing holiness all the way to the end of our life. And we're never content with sin. We're going to hopefully be putting sin to death by the Spirit till our dying days. So that's not what I'm talking about. The kind of contentment that I'm talking about is this. Contentment means cheerfully, trustfully submitting to what our Heavenly Father decides to do in everyday life. That's what I mean by contentment. Cheerfully and trustfully submitting to what our Heavenly Father decides to do in everyday life. Well, in order for us to cultivate this type of contentment, what do we need to do? Well, I think foundationally we need biblical truth. If we're going to learn Christian contentment, we need biblical truth. We need to love, cherish biblical truth. One of those truths that we need to love and cherish is found in our passage. So let me just read 11 to 13 again of Philippians 4. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The first biblical truth that we need in order to learn contentment is, that it is going to be through Christ who strengthens us. That's the only way we're going to learn consistent contentment is through Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from the Lord Jesus and his enabling grace, we will never learn the secret of contentment. We will learn it only through Christ who strengthens us. I love what one pastor said about this. He said, Paul was just a man. He was not a superman. He was a sinful man like we are. But Paul was a man who had boundless confidence in the ability of Jesus Christ to match every situation he faced. I love that. Paul was just a man, but he had boundless confidence in the ability of Jesus Christ to match every situation he faced. I hope that we will have a, a boundless confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace to match every situation we face foundational truth number two is what Greg already talked about before is that we need to know and love and cherish the fact that God is sovereign and God is good. I mean, this is absolutely, utterly essential for us to learn consistent contentment. God is sovereign, a verse that Jerry Ediger loves to quote, Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. R.C. Sproul said there are no maverick molecules in the entire universe. God is absolutely, utterly, completely sovereign over all, but God is good. He is good and to his people. I think about Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. The point, one pastor said, the point of this passage is that God has us covered. We are his children. He loves us. We as believers are his children. We've been adopted into his family. God loves us. He's in charge of our life and has everything under control. 
One pastor said, contentment begins with a settled confidence in God's sovereign control of all of the events of life that ultimately are going to reach us for our good. God is sovereign. God is good. I think Romans 8, 28, which I think Greg mentioned before as well, one of Jerry's all-time favorite verses, one of Fred's all-time favorite verses, a fantastic verse where Paul says, and we know, I know Jerry loves that, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Lots of stories I could use to illustrate this. I'll use one that I just read recently. I just finished this book about two missionaries. They, they wrote this book. Frank and Marie Drown wrote this book called Mission to the Headhunters. And they were faithful missionaries in the jungles of Ecuador for 37 years. They went there in 1945 and they stayed until 1982. And they knew a couple of the guys who died trying to reach the Warani, they knew Nate Saint, they knew Roger Udarian, and actually this guy Frank Drown led sort of the expedition in to try to find these guys later. But Frank and Marie wrote this book, Mission to the Headhunters, and they were stationed just sort of in the middle of the jungles. Uh, before they, uh, when they first went there in 1945, there, were not even, there was not even an airstrip in their mission field. And for them to get to their mission field, they had to hike Six days journey through the jungle just to get to their mission field. I mean, just crazy. No electricity, no running water, uh, no refrigeration. That's where they were, totally isolated. But they were working hard on the language and doing all kinds of things there. And Frank wanted to go to a missions conference. Well, in order for him to go to a missions conference, uh, he's got to take a six days journey through the jungle, then take a flight then fly back in six days through the jungle to, to come back. His wife was pregnant at the time. She stayed back with some other missionaries. So Frank takes off for this conference, comes back. And Frank was a man who I don't think had a lazy bone in his body, just working, working, working. Honestly, he reminded me of my grandfather who was a missionary in Africa. And my grandfather, no lazy bones in his body, just worked, just worked, just worked. That was Frank. So Frank gets back from this missions conference. And this is what he, he says. He had to start working, attending to the house. He's working on the airstrip. He's digging drainage ditches. He's harvesting wheat. He's planting gardens. He's working from daybreak to nightfall. But within a week, he was flat on his back with malaria that he had contracted on the trail coming home. And he's taking malaria medicine, but the malaria medicine is having no effects because he keeps uh, throwing it back up. He couldn't keep the malaria medicine down, so his fever is rising higher and higher. It's getting dangerously high. And then his wife realized they had some uh, malaria medicine that she could give him as an injection. She finds this medicine. She gets it all together. They had done some training about this sort of thing before going to the mission field. She gives him this injection. And finally, within 24 hours, the fever slowly began to drop. But here's Frank. Here's a man who wants to get out and work and do these things. Here's what he says.